Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Monday night Bible study. Tonight we are in Ecclesiastes chapter number 10. Once again, that's Ecclesiastes chapter number 10. Uh, before we get started, is there anyone that has any prayer requests before we get started? I'm going to ask you all, if you don't mind, to uh, pray for my wife. She went for her last uh, consultation today before her surgery on Wednesday. So please continue to keep her lifted up in prayer. Uh, once again, is there anyone that has any prayer requests before we get started? If we have no prayer requests, uh, Brother Kennedy, if you don't mind, would you please open us up with a word of prayer? Absolutely. Brother Kennedy? Absolutely. Let us bow. Our Father God in heaven, we're just so grateful and thankful um, to be amongst believers, just putting ourselves in position to study your word, Father. And we're just so grateful for this opportunity that you allow us to be present for. Um, we know tomorrow is in promise to no one. And the fact that we're here is just a testament of the grace and our mercy that you have on us, Father. And um, We just pray that those who are able to make it on these calls um, don't take it for granted. Um, Father, it is, it is it is rare in this day um, to have this dedicated um, this dedication um, geared towards studying your word aside from your your typical Wednesdays and, and Sundays. So we're just so grateful for your men servant who um, take the time to um, put these studies together. Um, Brother Green, Brother Stevenson, just um, allowing us to use their platforms and just creating a, a space where we can gather from the comfort of our homes to study a portion of your words, Father. Um, we're studying the book of Ecclesiastes, a very powerful um, and a great book um, that ultimately just lets us know that there's nothing new under the sun and the things that um, we're dealing with um, today, um, they have dealt with in the past and, and understanding that everything is vanity outside of you. Um, and we're just so grateful to know your son, Jesus, um, who you sent down from his heavenly home. So that way we may have access to the tree of life and be partakers of that everlasting life that is promised to us as long as we are obedient. And at this time, Father, we just pray for those who are needing prayer. Um, we have so many on this call. Everyone is dealing with something, Father. Um, you know their needs, but particularly, Father, we pray for um, Brother Green and his household and his wife who has been going to the doctor for treatment and has been receiving um, uh, having appointments to um, we just pray, Father, that. Um, whatever it is that she is in need of, Father, we just pray that um, that the doctors can find a solution or if there's a solution that is available for her, Father. And ultimately, Father, we know that prayer works and it e it works even more when those who are praying believe, Father. So we just pray that you search all our hearts and, 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 and the things that we are sincere about. Um, Father, if it be thy will, we just pray that you grant us those things, Father, and just continue to be with Brother Green. Um, as he is the rock in that household, Father, and as long as he continue to lean on your son, Jesus, the rock, we Father, we just know that that um, everything will be okay, Father. Um, we're just so grateful and thankful, and we're just so grateful to be a part of another study, and we look forward to your manservant um, being able to uh, uh, break the scriptures down in a way that we're able to receive it and apply it in our lives. Um, we ask these things in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Brother Stevenson at this time. We're in Ecclesiastes chapter number 10. Okay, I want to say good evening, everyone. Uh, thank y'all for being a part of these studies. Let me just make sure your mics are muted. If anybody don't have their mic muted, please mute your mic so that we don't get any feedback. We're in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, and in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 10, Solomon, you know, in our last study, actually, uh, has been giving us some uh, godly wisdom, uh, teaching us how to endure the vanities of life. Uh, he let us know in our last study that there are some things, brothers and sisters, that you and I can't avoid, in this world, there's some things that we can't change. Uh, but with godly wisdom, uh, we can still enjoy life and we can endure uh, the error and the wrong and the heartaches and the heartbreaks that we experience in this life, okay? Remember back in chapter 9, verse 10, the last verse of Ecclesiastes chapter 9, in verse, forgive me, verse 18, Solomon says, wisdom, and I want you to listen to this, wisdom is better than weapons of war. But one sinner destroyed much good. That's very important we get that. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner uh, destroyed much good. And we understand the opposite of wisdom is, is foolishness. You know, the opposite of being wise is being a fool. And so in chapter 10, what Solomon is 
is about to do is show us the danger of, of being fools or living lies that are foolish. And so we pick up in verse one, he said, dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a sneaking savor so that the lafali, him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. Yea, also, when he had this, when he had that as a fool, walk it by the way. Let me read that again. Yea, also, when he that is a fool, walk it by the way, his wisdom shall fail at him. And he said to everyone that he is a fool. If the spirit of the ruler rise up against you, leave not your place for yielding, pacifying, it says, great offenses. Okay, and so what, what Solomon has shown us, you know, you can be an individual uh, who has been known as wise, living a wise life. Uh, you can have a be an individual who has been honored and people, you know, hold you in high esteem and they have respect for you. But a little foolishness in your life can ruin all of that. And we have to understand what Solomon is saying is a little foolishness and living foolishly can, it can at the end of the day, can ruin your reputation. You know, and so we have got to be walking as people that are wise in this life. And you and I have got to be concerned about the reputation that we have and primarily the reputation that we have before God. I, everyone over here who's a Christian, we need to be concerned about our character because the character or the way we act should always represent represent God. OK. And so Solomon says a little you know, a little folly, you know, is just as strong you know, as the apothecary, a little folly is, is as strong as some good perfume, you know, and when you have some good perfume and you got a dead fly in it, I'm going to tell you, it messes the whole thing up. And that's really the idea. And so just understand a little, a little folly, a little foolishness, you know, can ruin, can ruin your reputation and the honor and the respect that people might might have for you. And so in verse two, again, he lets us know a wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart, he says, is is at his at his left hand. Okay. And so what he's letting us know is, you know, uh, you know, brothers and sisters, sin, sin, you know, is foolish. It, it, it causes you to act foolish and it causes you to think foolishly. It won't lead you in the right way. Really, that's Solomon's point. If you're walking as a fool, you'll start saying foolish things and you'll be acting in foolish ways. Remember the Psalms 14 and 1, uh, the psalmist says, a fool says in his heart that there is no God. See, and, and so those are the kind of uh, people that deny and, and reject wisdom. OK, and so uh, they they don't act like they're supposed to act. They don't say the things that they're, su they're supposed to say. And so when Solomon says what he says in verse three, yea, also when he that is a fool walking by the way, his wisdom failed him. And he said to everyone that he is a fool. And so he lets you know you want to be a fool. Foolishness will betray you. That's exactly what it do. And people will notice that, brothers and sisters. When you and I don't walk wise and we act as fools, foolishness will betray you. It will mock you. Uh, it will make a fool out of you. And it will be noticeable by the people you surround yourself with. Uh, a great example of that, you don't have to turn that tonight, just thinking about Nabal. In 1 Samuel chapter 25, you know, Nabal, who was the husband of Abigail, uh, uh, he, he, had, he was a rich man, a wealthy man. Uh, David and his men were taking care of his, of his property, of his sheep. And then it came time for shearing. And David sent some of his servants, you remember that, to just, you know, and send them peacefully to, to, to Nabal. You know, it's, it's this time of year for shearing. Give us some of your sheep. But the Bible lets us know this guy was a fool. But his wife was very spiritually to say, Abigail, that is. And so he was a fool and the people knew he was a fool and even his wife knew that he was a fool, which is exactly what his name, what his name means. OK, and so we have to understand that foolishness will betray you. And when you're a fool, I want you to understand something. People will recognize it. One of the things I hold on to just sidebar here, one of the things I hold on to. And I've heard this a long time ago and I, I still hold on to it today. It's better, brothers and sisters, to keep your mouth shut sometime and be thought of as a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. I'm going to say that again. So it's better to keep your mouth shut and be thought of as a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Some of us can say some crazy, some people already think you're crazy, not a fool, but then you open your mouth, oh yeah, we were exactly right, this is a fool talking. And, that, and so we got to make sure that we walk wise and we want to be perceived as wise with godly wisdom. And when you have godly wisdom, you will be wise. Okay, you'll go to the right places and you'll know how to handle, how to handle yourself. Now look at verse four. He says, if the spirit of the ruler rise up 
against you, leave not your place for yielding pacified great offense. Now, why would Solomon say that? Because a person who wise uh, and has wisdom would know how to control himself when he's standing before people. You know how to handle the opposition. You know how to deal with situations when you have wisdom. That's what he's saying now. A fool don't know how to deal with opposition. A fool don't know how to deal with government and authority and, and their, their masters. Uh, they don't know how to handle their boss at their job. But wisdom knows how to handle opposition, knows how to calm the situation down. You don't know how to handle themselves, self-control, really, at the end of the day. Proverbs chapter 25, hold your tassel in Ecclesiastes 10, and go with me to Proverbs chapter 25. I want to look at a scripture in verse number 15. Proverbs 25, 15, another, another scripture from the wisdom from the wisdom literature given to us by the Holy Spirit. In Proverbs chapter 25, listen what Solomon writes. Same Solomon that's preaching in the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, Proverbs chapter 25 and verse number 15. The Bible says, by long forbearing is a prince persuaded, and a soft tongue breaketh the bone. Y'all see that? I'm going to read it again. By long forbearing is a prince persuaded. In other words, you have these leaders, and maybe they are not good leaders. And Paul and Simon's going to show us more of this as we go on. Maybe they're not good leaders, but he says a soft tongue breaketh the bone. Okay? And so in other words, you know how to handle situations. You know how to handle people that may not be acting right or doing right. And so when Solomon, going back to Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 4, he said, the spirit of the ruler rise up against you, leave not thy place for yielding pacifieth great offenses, okay? You just, you do what you can, you do what you're supposed to do and know how to, how to control yourself, okay? And so when you don't know how to do that and you don't know how to walk wise, it's dangerous. When you live and act foolish, brothers and sisters, it's dangerous. It can harm you and it can harm other people as well. OK, so now we get to verse number six, verse number five. Forgive me. What Solomon says he sees in his wisdom, he sees that foolishness is even in government. Look in verse number five and we're going to read down to verse seven. He said, there is an evil which I've seen under the sun as an error which proceeded from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity and the rich sit in low place. He said, I have seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants, he says, upon the earth. OK. And so Solomon says, man, I see, you know, rulers even making errors. And we got to understand that sometimes all governments, brothers, and sisters, all people in government, let me say it like this, are not righteous. All rulers in government are not wise. And so there are some people that rule and they rule for their own greed. You know, they rule for their own agenda and they make errors. Maybe it's because of money, the love of money. You know, they take bribes. And so what Solomon says here, I mean, I see I see rulers that make errors. That's what he said. There is an evil which I've seen under the sun as an error which proceeded from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity. Even government can act foolishly. That's what he's saying. And when government acts foolish, there are some that praise that. You know that? We live in a land where government makes rules that go against God's word. That's foolish. When you make laws that go against God's word, we see that, and that's foolish. There are governments that call good evil and calling evil good as the days of Isaiah, Isaiah 5, 20 and 21. They're calling good evil, and they're calling evil good. And we see that in, in government. And so what he sees here is he sees a government that's really upside down. That's what he sees here. I mean, here you have foolishness that is being praised. He said, that's what I see. I see folly is in great dignity and the rich are sitting in low places. And he sees servants upon, that's backwards. And princes walking as servants upon the earth. That's an upside down government. That's, that's out of order. You see what he's saying there? He sees a government that's not functioning properly. That's what he sees. And Solomon says, and it's a bunch of foolishness. And you know, the idea of brothers and sisters, when, when God's pattern for authority is twisted, when it's turned upside down, that's foolish. What, I, what that means when, when you think about just your home life, when you got your kids running the parents, or you got the wife running the husband, that goes against 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3. See, that's backwards. That's that's upside down. That breaks God's divine pattern 
for authority, the way God wants it to be represented. And when that foolishness happens, what it causes is destruction. At the end of the day, you'll destroy, you'll destroy your own life, you'll destroy your own home, and governments are destroyed the same way when they operate under agenda. That's not God's agenda, okay? That's not God's agenda, okay? And so when things are out of order, anybody got any questions on the first seven verses? Any question on the first seven verses? All right, so we look at verse number eight, and uh, let me get somebody else to read this. Uh, brother uh, brother uh, Coffee, can you read verse eight through 10 for us tonight? Yes, and the scripture reads, and he that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whosoever breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall shall bite him, and who and whoso removeth the stone shall be put shall be hurt um, therewith, and he that cleaveth good wood uh, shall endanger thereby, and if the iron be blunt, uh, and he do not wit the edge, uh, then must he put more strength. But wisdom is uh, profitable to direct. All right. Thank you, my brother. So know that Solomon is letting us know, you know, people who, who are foolish and not wise, at the end of the day, you hurt yourself. You hurt yourself. Look at verse 8 again. You, you, you're a fool. You dig a pit and you're going to fall into it. You, whosoever breaking a hedge, a serpent shall, shall bite him. And so you're, you're so foolish you're not wise that when you're moving ahead or you're not looking for, for, for snakes, you're not looking, you're not looking for something that could be under it that can harm you. That's the idea. A fool thinks that they're going to they're going to get away with something. That's the idea They they don't think if they if it comes to their mind, they just do it. If it comes to their mind, they just say it. So what he's saying is a fool at the end of the day, all they do is they hurt themselves. You dig a pit, you fall in it. What, what ain't that fool? You're a fool. You break, you break a hedge and a serpent gonna bite you. You know, brother says, I wanna, I wanna say this. Godly wisdom is so important. You know, it, it, it's what will protect us, you know, from the wrath of God whenever the father sends his son back. Wisdom. Nobody is getting away, as we've already studied in Ecclesiastes 8. Nobody's getting away with the things that they say and the way that you act if it's contrary to God and you don't repent of it. Nobody's getting away. There's no way, nowhere you and I can hide and run from the wrath of God. You know, I'm just thinking about, hold your tassel on Ecclesiastes 10. Go with me to Amos. Listen to this. You know, one of the things when God sent Amos to the children of Israel with his message, God told Amos in Amos chapter four, he tells, he told Amos that, you know what? I sent all these plagues. I sent, God said, I sent them all. I sent the plagues. I sent the, the pestilence. I sent all these things on you all. You know, I sent, I sent the drought. I sent all this, but now why did God allow all this to go on? Well, because God wanted them to, here we go, repent. Get rid of your ways, get rid of the ways you are treating other people, get rid of your idol gods. And so God said, I sent all these, this, these, uh, these calamities on you. When you look at Amos 4, I'm not going to read this, but all the way down to 5 to 11, you'll say, you'll see what God was doing uh, uh, to, to Judah. Now look in verse 12. Therefore, Amos 4, 12, therefore, thus will I do unto you, O Israel, and because I will do this unto you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel, okay? And so what we notice when you look at this, at all the plagues that God sent on in Amos 4, at the end of every one of them, God said, yet have you not returned unto me. You look at the end of verse six at, uh, um, when God sent the famine. Why did you send it, God? Because I sent it, but you still didn't return unto me. Verse number eight, he sent the drought. Yet have you not returned unto me. Verse nine, he sent the plagues, yet have you not returned unto me? And so God allowed these disasters to take place for the purpose of causing them to repent, to turn and turn to him. But of course, you know, they, they didn't change. They kept on doing what they were doing and thinking they're going to get away. Now, look at Amos chapter five with me. Look at this incident. It's kind of kind of hilarious when you look at it, because 
in Amos chapter five, and you look at verse number 18, because it's talking about now Amos is going to get to the point where he starts talking about the day of the Lord judgment day. You know, there's people that's living in sin and living foolish and got nerve enough to talk about. I can't wait till Jesus come back. Now, that's a fool. I'm going to tell you, so you know, you got some sin in your life. You haven't fixed, you haven't straightened up, but yet you're talking about, I can't wait till Jesus come back. <laughs> Foolish. As if, as if you're not going to be judged for your unrepentant of sin. And so they would have this attitude in Amos' day that, hey, we're God's people, you know, and, uh, you know, we, we're waiting on the day of the Lord. You know, and look at verse 18. Look at this. Isn't it this? And God says, woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Anybody who don't repent like a fool, yeah, that's a day of darkness, brothers and sisters, not light. Now listen to what he says is light. He says, if a man did flee from a lion, so you think you're going to get away, oh, I got away from a lion, and a bear met him. Or he went into the house and he leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. <laughs> So he, so he said, judgment day is going to be like, you think you got away from the line, but guess what? You ran right into a bed. Here's a person that, that ran. Uh, he ran into the house. I'm safe. Put his hand to a wall and a serpent bit him. That's the idea. You're not getting away. See, what we can't be is we cannot be fools because we're going to be judged by God, every one of us. And we're going to give an account for the things we've done and the things we said while in the body. And so going back to Ecclesiastes 10, Solomon, you know, he's letting us know, brothers and sisters, you know, you and I don't need to be foolish because at the end of the day, you're just going to hurt yourself. I'm going to hurt myself. And foolish people don't have to they got to see that, but they refuse. They refuse to hear the truth. They fail to want to hear the truth of God's word. And so we go back to Ecclesiastes 10. And as our brother Coffee read, look in verse 10. Here's what here's how fools work. If the iron be blunt and he do not wet the end. In other words, you got a blunt, a blunt tool you're going to cut down hedges with. You need to sharpen it. If you don't sharpen it, you're going to be working harder. A fool is still out there trying to cut something with a butter knife, trying to cut down a tree with the wrong tool. So he said, here's a guy, a fool. This is what fools do. The iron he's using is blunt and you do not wet the edge. You're a fool. And he says, then must he put to more strength, but wisdom is profitable to direct. In other words, wise people know how to work harder. I mean, work smarter and not harder. That's the idea. Wise people know, man, I'm going to be smart about the work that I need to do so I don't have to work as hard. But people who are fools, they don't listen. They think they know it all. They think they're smarter than everybody else, even God. And this is why they got more toil and more labor than need be. Any question? So again, what Solomon is teaching us, brothers and sisters, is how you and I can enjoy life and with godly wisdom and be prosperous. Okay, save ourselves a lot of heartache and a lot of pain. Okay, verse 11 through 15. Uh, Mother dear, can I get you to read 11 through 15 for me? Now, before she reads this, He's going to show us here that fools don't know how to control themselves. You know, one of the fruit of the spirit, brothers, is self-control. Fools very seldomly know how to control themselves, the attitude. Okay, read that for me. 11 through 15, please. Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment, and a blabber is no better. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is mischief, madness. A fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be and what shall be after him. Who can tell him? Mm. The labor of the foolish weareth every one of them, because he knoweth not how to go to the city. Mm. See that? Can't control his tongue. Can't control himself. A fool don't know how to handle his tongue, handle his life. Like I said, if it if it comes to his mind, he don't think before he don't think long enough before he speaks. Just say whatever comes out. Can't control his tongue. Look at that again. Surely, he says, the serpent 
will bite without enchantment. And a babbler is no better. It is no better. Go to Proverbs 15 to hold your tassel there. Look at another scripture that Solomon gives us about our tongue and how and how to control ourselves, brothers and sisters. Proverbs 15, 1 and 2. A soft answer, turn away wrath. But grievous words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise. Use it knowledge aright. You know what? What the you know the difference between knowledge and wisdom? There's a difference, brothers and sisters, between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is information. And I believe a lot of us, we have knowledge, but wisdom is the skill or the ability to use that information, to know how to handle it. You may know something. But you can abuse what you know. You can do more harm than good with your knowledge. Please understand that. You can know something, but not be wise in what you know. Don't know how to say it or when to say it. It's like a person with money. You can have money and know how to make it, but if you're not wise, you don't know how to spend it. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people got a lot of money, but they're not wise. So just because you have knowledge and have money don't mean you're wise. This is why when we read last week in Ecclesiastes 9, when we talked about the poor man that saved a city, this man was a poor man. He was a poor man, but his wisdom is what saved the city. That's why he said wisdom is better than weapons of war. But one sinner destroyed much good. Y'all understand that? Wisdom. When you listen to God, and when we do and act like God wants us to do, then it's wise and we can save lives. You remember, and again, sidebar, you remember Joshua, when you look in Joshua 7, remember Achan, when God sent uh, the children of Israel, they were going through Jericho and God said, I want you to destroy everything, don't take nothing, burn, uh, everything's not good, the rest goes into my house. You remember what Achan did? Well, he took some of God's stuff. He went and got in Jericho, he took some of God's stuff and he hid it in his tent. And God knew exactly what he did, just like God knows exactly what you and I do and hide from God. And they lost a little bitty battle uh, when they've been winning. When they took over great Jericho, they lost that little bitty battle with I, AI. They lost that battle. They even downsized their army. Yeah, we just beat Jericho. You know, we can take little I. He downsized the army and they lost. Why? Because Achan. His little sin destroyed a bunch of people, destroyed, destroyed people's lives. That's what it does. It destroyed his family. He wasn't wise. He didn't do what God told him to do. And so one sinner can destroy much good. When you and I don't know how to talk and know how to handle ourselves, the knowledge we have with wisdom, we can do more harm good to ourselves and to our family. Matter of fact, when you think about what I talked about earlier, you think about Nabal in 1 Samuel 25. His foolishness almost got his whole house killed. Now, David was wrong, but the idea is if Abigail hadn't stopped David, this fool was going to lose his whole family because he don't know how to talk to people and don't know how to handle situations. And I just wonder how many of us, you know, homes aren't what they're supposed to be because we don't know how to control this little pink muscle in our mouth. We don't know how to, when to shut up and when to talk and how to talk. There's a way to do it, brother. So there's a way to get your point across without killing and destroying people's lives. All right, I'm going to leave it alone. Okay, let's go back to Ecclesiastes 10. Any question or comment? Let me see. Any question or comment? Any any question or comment? Yeah. I just yes, go ahead, brother. Good here. job tonight. Good Thank job you. tonight, brother Henry. Thank you, preach. God bless you. I wanted just to add uh, just a few scriptures. Uh, when you look at uh, the, New, the New Testament, uh, you look at uh, 1 Corinthians 5, um, when he mentions uh, the gentleman that was sleeping with his father's wife, verse 2 says, And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he had done uh, this deed might be taken away uh, from among you. So when it comes to that word puffed up, inflated is the definition of haughty, proud is the definition of, uh, of puffed up. And they had prophets there. They had individuals that were 
uh, miraculously gifted with miracles, uh, the ability to speak in tongues or interpret, and but they had sin, and so because they had knowledge, and then they didn't, they weren't swift to execute and get rid of the sin. They were puffed up just by the knowledge, and they didn't want to remove the sin from the camp. And so when you look at First uh, Corinthians thirteen four, charity suffered long and is kind. Charity envy not. Charity vaunted not itself. Is not puffed up. So what you need is, uh, you need love, you need knowledge, wisdom. You know, you need love for God above all men, in order to remove the sin, because you can have, um, you can have knowledge without love, and that'll puff you up because you can't execute love when it's time to, or mercy when it's time to. That's why individuals have problems with marriage, divorce, remarriage, or other subjects in the Bible, because they don't have a love or the mercy of God to be able to teach. And it's time to teach that. And so, yeah, that is it's needful to, to have the mind of Christ. And there's other scriptures that describe his mind and don't remove mercy and love from the equation because it does, rem it, it'll cause you to be puffed up by, by the other scriptures that you've learned in, and, and uh, read before in the past. So I just wanted to bring that up. Go ahead. Thank you, brother Javier. Yeah, great point, my brother. Uh, and and just a back, big piggyback on what you said. Uh, you went to First Corinthians five, but Paul also talks about it in First Corinthians eight. And I do want to hone in on that one too, you know, because there are brothers and sisters that may not be as knowledgeable, brothers and sisters, about certain things as you think you are, or that you even may be. Not just think you you may be more knowledgeable in areas of of religion or 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 just worldly uh, things than other people. But at the same time, you cannot allow your knowledge uh, to destroy other people. You know, even parents with your children, some of us, man, we can just act so irate toward our children because they might not know a certain thing that you think they ought to know. And some of us will put ourselves full blast on them. And God don't treat you like that. But just because they ask what you think they ought to know and just because you know it, you, you come in and you can be just overbearing, man. And, and what happened is, you know, your, your kids can, you know, don't want to be around you. You know, they can they can withdraw from you because of your your attitude, even though you might be right. Sometimes it's how you say it, you know, how you say, and, and And at the end of the day, we want to. We want to get to a point to where we we're using wisdom and understand that discipline is what we do for somebody and not to somebody. There's a difference. You know, you you discipline your children because you want them to understand. That's why I always stress on these kingdom family studies. When you discipline your children, all that shut up and and they and and, and not telling them why you're disciplining them. How does that help them? You know, how does that help them? At the end of the day, you discipline because you want to teach them so that they can do better and be better next time anyway. And that's how we need to treat our brothers and sisters in Christ, too. Now, look at verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 8 as I move on. Now as such in things offered unto idols. Now, this is what Paul said. We know that we all have knowledge. So Paul said, we know, you know, that idols is not real gods. They're made up in people's mind because we know there's only one God. But notice what he says. Knowledge puffs up. But charity edifies. What are you saying? Knowledge without wisdom. I'll tell you what it does. It can become puffed up. But what love does, it builds up. Please understand that. Knowledge puffs. There's some people that want to know the Bible, know the Bible, know scriptures, quote scriptures. But why do you want to know it? <laughs> why do you want to share it? Is it because you love people or you just want to be seen as somebody great and not want to flex your spiritual muscles among people? I'm talking so many people want to be preachers. I say, why? I mean, again, we need preachers. Don't get me wrong. But why do you want to be a preacher? I don't know why everybody think being a preacher, a teacher is just just joy to the world. Or do you want to be because you think you'll be uplifted? Why do you want to be a teacher? Why do you want to be an elder? Why do you want to be a deacon? Why? Why? I wonder anybody on here want to be Hosea. Anybody want to be a prophet like Hosea? How about how being Hosea? I think that was a glorious job for Hosea to go out and marry a, a, a woman of whoredoms. I don't hear nobody say, I want to be Hosea. I wish God have made me Hosea. Or Paul. 
Yeah, I'm telling you, bro, so, so we got to make sure. And so just understand that knowledge puffs up, but charity, be, love, it builds up. And we're in the building up business, okay, in the building up business. All right, going back to 1 Corinthians, uh, forgive me, Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Now, notice what he's saying about the fool. Again, as was read in verse number 15, Ecclesiastes 10, 15. He says, the labor of the foolish wearieth every one of them. <laughs> I mean, a fool just wearies everybody. Everybody, uh, because he knoweth not how to go to the city. Now, what are you saying? A fool, don't, again, don't know how to control himself. Don't know how to go to the city. You know, you go to the city, you go to the store. You know, when you go to the city, you got to go to court. A fool don't know how to handle himself in court. You ever know anybody that contempt the court? Just hit the, the, the gavel. Contempt the court. Everywhere you go in the city, oh, here come this fool. Don't know how to conduct yourself. And it's noticeable. People notice that. So when you're a fool, you don't know how to handle government. You don't know how to handle judges. You talk back to all kind of authority. And you're a fool. And all you're doing is hurting yourself. Okay? Because you because you very seldom as a fool, you practice self-control. You don't know how to control yourself. You think you're always right. Nobody can tell you nothing. Not even the judge. You don't know how to handle yourself when you go to the city. All right. Any questions on that? Okay, uh, Brother Claude, can I get you to close us out? Uh, forgive me. Can you read? Yeah, close us out 16 through verse number 20, Brother Claude, if you don't mind. Are you able to do that for me, Brother Claude? 16. Or to, to thee, O Lamb, when the, thy king is a child, and thy prince is eight in his morning, blessed art thou, O Lamb, when thy king is a son of nobles. And thy princes eat in due seasons for strength and not for drunkenness, but much slowful, slowfulness and building, decaying, and through illnesses, idleness, idleness of the hand, and the house drops through. A feast is made of laughter. And wine making is merry, but money answers all things. The curse, not the king, no, not in thy thoughts, and curse not the riches in thy bedchambers, for the bird of the air shall carry thy voice, and thy witch has wings shall tell the matter. All right. Thank you, my brother. And so what Solomon has shown us in these last verses, brother, says that, you know, the fools and the wise people have an effect on everybody. And, and, and particularly, he's dealing with, even when you talk about government, because when you look at verse 5, woe to, that, to, to the land when the king is a child. When you have a ruler, when you have somebody that's ruling, that is a foolish leader, a leader that's acting childish on his ways, you know, it's got to be about him. All he's worried about is partying all day. That's what he's saying, man. The, the, the people, man, you got that kind of king, man. You know, it, it, all he wants to do is, is party and, and get drunk and make laws for sin. Man, woe to that land. You know, woe to that land whose leaders don't rule well. All about good timing. But he says, but blessed is the land. When the king is the son of noble, I love that son of no, and your princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. When you got leaders and rulers who 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 are wise, and and they know they know there's a time to work and there's a time to play. And and when and when it comes to feasting, you know they're not feasting for sin. That's when the land is good. When you when you're living with a government that that's living righteous and and based upon god's laws and so both has an effect both of them you can you can identify a wise uh ruler and a and a foolish ruler it's foolish brothers and sisters and be foolish even even in our own homes you know to to always just want to party good time you know there's a time to work there's a time for for laughter there's a time for fun but there's also a time to work Otherwise, your house, notice what he says. Look, by, look at verse 18. By much slothfulness, the building decayed. And through idleness of the hands, the house drop it through. That's what he's saying there. 
There's a time for all that. Life ain't all about party, 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 and, and living it up. And then you neglect the responsibility. You neglect the things that matter because you want to party all day and making laws that, you know, that benefit you. You know, you can't, you can't, that's not good, brothers and sisters. And so we got to understand that fools do that. Fools do that. But even though, now I want you, I want you to know what Solomon said. Now, even though we have people in government, that's not always wise. And again, let me say this, brothers and sisters, we are to obey the government. I'll make sure you and I get that. When you and I go to the courts or whatever you go, you have a court date, uh, maybe you've done something wrong, uh, you obey the government as long as the government is not trying to get you and I to go against what God has commanded us to do. But as you and I living in this world, we ought to be respecting the government. And we are, as Paul said in 1 Timothy 2, we ought to be praying for the government. Those, the kings and the rulers and those that are in authority, that we can continue to live peaceful lives. That's what we want. And so, again, we're not supposed to be causing insurrections and fighting against the government. We're not supposed to be doing that. And, and to, Paul, and to uh, Solomon's point, you're not to be cursing the king. That's what he's saying here. Be careful what you say. Be careful what you're saying about people. Be careful what you're saying about your boss. Be careful about what you're saying about your husband. Be careful what you're saying about your wife in secret. That's what he's saying. Watch what you're saying about people. Because by some means or another, it can very well get back to them. That's what he's saying. Now, notice that verse again, verse 20. Curse not the king, no, not in your thought. You see that? And curse not the rich in the bedchamber. For a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which had wings shall tell the matter. You see what he's saying there? Watch what you're saying in your private, intimate thoughts and in your private conversations. You know, you gotta, we got to watch what we say. We got to be wise, brothers and sisters. God is listening. God knows our hearts and our thoughts. And we've got to understand that. So all he's teaching us in this chapter, control yourself. You know, don't let your anger, brothers and sisters. I'm telling you, yeah, there's how people can make you angry. Things you see in life, experience in life can make you angry, but do not. You can be angry, but don't sin. Ephesians 4, 25 and 26, you can be angry, but don't sin. So you can be angry about some things, and what will happen is you can make that anger cause you to be vengeful. Please understand that. And when you and I become so angry that we want to <laughs> become vengeful, that's, see, that's David. David in 1 Samuel 25 became vengeful. You know, this man didn't give me what I wanted, so I'm going to kill him and everybody. That's vengeance. That's not justice. That's vengeance. You're ready to kill everybody. Remember, uh, uh, yeah. I'm going to kind of show you this story since we're so quick through this. I, I want to read this. Go, go to uh, Genesis 34. Just thinking about this. I think I can read this quick. I want to show you an account of Jacob's boys, Reuben and, and uh, I think it was Reuben. No, it wasn't Reuben. It was uh, Simeon and Levi. Memory served me right. Go to Genesis 34. When they when they, when they they sister got raped. See, brother and sister, that can make you angry, man. Somebody do something to your family and rape your, they rape your sister. But you gotta, we gotta be wise, though. You know, we we gotta know that vengeance belongs to the Lord. We're not to take vengeance in our own hand. Again, we believe in justice. You use the court system, but you and even the court system can't be vengeful. Their spirit cannot be vengeful, uh, a spirit of vengeance. You know, they're to serve justice. That's what they're there for. But to, to be vengeful, no, you and I can't do that. You can be angry. We're supposed to be angry. Angry is a defense mechanism. God was angry. Jesus was angry. But you got to control yourself. Be wise, brothers and sisters. We got to be wise. Now, listen to this. What happened here to Jacob's boy? I want you to listen to this story in case you never heard this. Listen to this. Verse one, Genesis 34, one. And Dina, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled. In other words, he raped her. That's what he did. And his soul clave unto Dina, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel and spake kindly unto the damsel. And Shechem spake unto his father, Hamor, saying, get me this damsel to wife. So this guy Shechem is asking his daddy. I'm going to explain as I go along. This guy Shechem is asking his daddy, Hamor, to go talk to Jacob about this woman he raped, Dina, to be his wife. Now, that's what's going on. Now, listen with this. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dina, his daughter. Now, his sons were with his cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace until they would come. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out unto Jacob to commune with him. And the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard it, 
And the men were grieved, and they were very wrought because he had wrought folly. Know that word folly. This man acted foolish. That's what he did. Foolish in Israel in line with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought not to have been done. So this guy shouldn't have slept with this rape, this uh, this girl. He shouldn't have done that. And his boys over here, Jacob, talking to Hamer. So listen to this. And Hamer communed with them, saying, the soul of my son. Now, he's speaking on behalf of his son. His son loves the girl. And but but notice this: the soul of my son Shechem. He's talking to Jacob. Long it for your daughter. I pray you give her to, uh, give her him to wife, and make ye marriages with us, and give your daughters unto us, and take our daughters unto you. And she shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade you therein, and get your possessions therein. And Shechem said unto her father, and said unto her brethren, Let me find grace in your eyes. And what you shall say unto me, I will give. Ask me never so much dowry and gift, and I will give according as you shall say unto me, but give me the damsel to wife. And the sons of Jacob answered Shechem. Now listen to what Jacob's boys answered. And Hamor, his father, deceitfully, they're being deceitful, and said, because he had defiled Dina, their sister, and they said unto them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised. For that were approach unto us. Now, notice what they're saying. These are Gentiles. These are not. And so what he's saying is, hey, y'all want our daughter? This is what the uh, Jacob's son saying. You want our daughter, Dina? Well, what y'all need to do is get yourself circumcised. We can't give them to y'all. Give it to y'all unless you're circumcised. Now, look at verse 15. But in this will we consent unto you, if you will be as we, that every male of you be circumcised. Then will we give our daughter unto you and we will take your daughter to us and we will dwell with you and we will become one people. But if you will not hearken unto us to be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and we will be gone. OK, and their words, please, Hamer and Shechem, Hamer's son. And the young man or the young man deferred not to do the thing because he had delight in Jacob's daughter. And so they wanted to do it. They agreed. With, with Jacob's son to be circumcised. All the male boys going to be circumcised, right? And he was more honorable than all the house of his father. Now listen to this. And Hamar and Shechem, his son, came unto the gate of the city, commune with the men of the city, saying, These men are peaceable with us. Therefore, let them dwell in the land and trade therein, for the land, behold, is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters uh, to us for wives, and let us give them our daughters only herein will the men consent unto us for to dwell with us, to be one people. Here's, here's what we got to do. If we're going to marry their daughter, they're going to marry ours. This is what they said we got to do. If every male among us be circumcised as they are circumcised. So they're announcing this to their people in the city. Shall not their cattle and their substance and every beast of theirs be ours? Only let us consent unto them and they will dwell with us. And unto Hamer and unto Shechem his son hearken all that went out of the gate of his city, and every male was circumcised all that went out of the gate of his city. Now listen to this. And it came to pass on the third day when they were sore that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dina's brethren, took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the male. That's vengeance. That's, that's vengeance. Do I have a right to be angry? Yeah. Right to take vengeance? No. No. Now listen to this. And they slew Hamer and Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword and took Dina out of Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain. They spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. They mad. They took their sheep. They took their oxen. They took their asses and that which was in the city and that which was in the field and all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives took they captive and spoiled even all that was in the house. Now, listen, this is what I like. See, again, brothers, a little folly. I want to get this. Make it the apothecary to stink. See, this is why you and I have to walk wise, because what we do and how we act affects your family. It affects your name, your character. It, it should represent that of your father. Please understand that. That's why you got to be concerned about your reputation, because your reputation don't just hurt you. It don't just represent you. It represents your family. And we're in the family of God. God is our father. So listen to what Jacob says to these boys. And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have troubled me 
to make me to stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And I being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me, and I shall be destroyed, I and my house. And they said, should he deal with our sister as with a harlot? See, they're still mad. But notice Jacob's response here. What y'all done wasn't right. And what you have done in not being wise, it didn't just affect you, it affects me as well. I think we, we know that. I'm going to close. I think we know this. Anybody who, who has ever had drug dealers in their home, you see it all the time. People, you got people in your house, your son, your daughter are dealing drugs. Let me tell you something. Drug dealers know, yeah, you know, when you do them wrong, you know, or you mess up on a deal, they ain't just coming after you. They're going to come after the people you love. Please understand that. They're going to come after the people that you love. So you don't just, when you're not acting foolish, it don't just affect you. Just like uh, Achan, just like these boys here in this text, it can affect the whole, just like Nabal, it can affect the whole house. This is why we need to act wisely. Pray for wisdom, brothers and sisters, and live wise life. Redeem the time, walk circumspectly, because the days are evil. Okay, and so Solomon is letting us know how to walk wise, brothers and sisters, how to live. I don't care what the government is doing. You act right. I don't care what your boss is doing, your mask. You act right. You still walk wise and understand that vengeance belongs to the Lord and he will repay. Okay. All right. I'm going to turn it back over to you, Brother Green. Thank you for allowing me to teach this chapter. And a beautiful lesson, my brother. Also, I just want to make a quick reminder. Uh, we're almost finished with the book of Ecclesiastes. Our next study will be going into the book of Proverbs. So anyone that, that want to study ahead, uh, our next study will be going into the book of Proverbs. So with that being said, um, reminder tomorrow, uh, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time on Brother Stevenson's own page, We'll be continuing in our lessons on kingdom families and kingdom marriages. Once again, um, Central Standard Time on Brother Stevenson's Zoom page. Um, also, um, is there anybody that has any uh, prayer requests before we close out? Any prayer requests? Any prayer requests? All right, we have, I'll oh, go ahead, Brother Kaufman. Uh, actually, I just wanted to make a comment on, on the message tonight. Great message, Brother Stevenson. Um, one of the things that, that, you know, we have to learn is, you know, especially when we're dealing with our emotions, and, and even what we're initially being told, which could cause us to go to anger. But oftentimes we need to be patient to get the facts, because sometimes the story is not necessarily always what it appears to be. And then we'll make ourselves look foolish because we have overreacted and not just calm, holding our peace uh, before reacting. And, and again, that's just something that oftentimes we'll find ourselves in at that moment. And we have to just sometimes just cool ourselves before we start reacting and saying things. But once we said it, it's, it's already done. That's my comment. Thank you for that, Brother Coffee. And I would like to reiterate something that Brother Stevenson said at the beginning of the study. Um, when we start the study, could you all please make sure your mics are muted because uh, the background noise and, and not only that, you know, the feedback and everything, and there's stuff that's being said and we're picking up on that and these are being recorded. So I, I implore you, please, could you please make sure your mics are muted uh, when we're in the studies. Um, and thank you, Brother Coffee, because um, I kind of had a little brain freeze. Is there anybody else that has any questions or comments pertaining to tonight's study? You know, a scripture to Brother Coffee's uh, uh, point is Proverbs 18 and 17. This is what wise people do, brothers and sisters. And this is very key when you talk about counseling people. This is what Solomon said. He that is first in his own cause seemeth just but his neighbor cometh and searcheth him. I love that scripture because some of us are quick to believe the first person that runs to us and tell them about a situation. See, the first person that run to you and wants you, and it, and it could be right or wrong, I don't know, but what you need to do, wise people do, 
is they search out the act of the facts. That's what you do. You don't just go on it because somebody said or base your feelings on because somebody and think about somebody uh, the way the person that came to you ought to think about somebody. That's not that's not wise for you and I to do that. It's not wise for you to with somebody else, you know, and you close to hate somebody. I hate them, too. That's not that's not you need to be looking for the truth. That's what wise people do. And so the first person that runs to you don't mean they're right. The one that talked the loudest don't mean they're right. Okay, we need to understand that. And so control yourself. You get the information, listen, and then you bring the parties together if need be, and you get all of the facts, and then you handle it. But you don't just get angry, you know, just because you hear. I mean, you can get angry, but you know, control yourself. Control the anger. Don't become a sinner. Thank you for that, Brother Steve. Brother Coffee, I see your hand. Uh, yes, and, and another comment you, you made um Brother Stevenson was um, thinking long enough. You know, oftentimes, you know, when, when the scripture teaches us that vengeance is not ours, it might take me 15, 20 minutes to get to where I need to get to to try to figure out what's going on. And something within me should be telling me to just calm myself down. I got a long time to think, but I'm just so angry, emotionally just spent to where you know, again, if you don't have yourself under control, you're just going to really just make it. Now, you can, like you said, it can be right. But oftentimes, it's, you know, and, and who we are representing. And as you stated maybe a few sessions back, we can be angry, but anger can sometimes just really cause the whole situation to turn out to be a mess because you're looking at, you know, minister so and so or deacon so and so. And you would think, good gracious, can you handle yourself a little bit better than that? He just stepped on the shoe. That's all he did. You know what I mean? That's just my comment. Thank you for that. Uh, Sister Vera. I just want prayer requests for my health. That's all. Yes, ma'am. Uh, is there anybody else that has any questions or comments that's pertaining to tonight's study? Or do you, if you have anything that's not pertaining to tonight's study, any questions or comments at all? All right, is there any prayer requests before we sign out? Any prayer requests? All right, if there's no prayer requests, I'm gonna ask Brother, uh, Brother Lewis, if you're able, my brother, would you close us out with a word of prayer? Sure, let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this time that we're able to call in on the, on the Zoom call and study another portion of your word. We're so thankful for your manservant, Brother Henry Stevenson, for leading us in this study in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 uh, to, to pour from the scriptures some things, to, to point out some things for us, Father, to grow in, in, in knowledge and in truth, Father, uh, that we may grow in wisdom, Father, from the, from the scriptures. We're so thankful for all the saints that are that are on, Father. It's, it's so encouraging to see so many strong uh, Christians, Father, who have a desire, to sincere desire to learn more about you, Father, to draw nearer to you by studying your holy and divine word. We pray, Father, that you bless those uh, uh, represented on this call. Uh, be with, we ask, Father, that you will bless them and their families and their loved ones, Father. Be with them, uh, as was stated, those who may be going through some uh, medical treatments or procedures and tests and studies, Father, and just our overall health, Father. We just pray that you will grant us, bless us with, with continued good health, Father, that we may live these days uh, that you have granted us, Father, to, to do your will to, for your purpose, Father, and not our own. Father, we just pray that our desire be to please you, uh, to continue to fear you, Father, and to keep your commandments. We pray, Father, that you will continue to watch over us uh, this, this, uh, this night, uh, Father, and be thy will that you will bless us to see the, the sun come up, that we may continue to give you the glory and honor and praise. We thank you, Father. We love you. We thank you, Father, for your gift, for giving us your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for, for our sins, Father. And we just uh, we just continue to ask these prayers in your son's Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Brother Lewis. Brother Lewis. That being said, uh, good night, brothers and sisters. May God continue to bless 
keep each and every one of you. Love you all dearly with the love of Christ until we meet again, if it be the Lord's will. Good night. God Good bless. Night. Praying for you, Sister Vera and Sister Denise. We're praying for y'all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good lesson, brother.